when I was asked, when I was asked uh, to talk about the church strategizing for missions, or or the church hand in hand for global missions, I was scrumming for ideas. You see, I'm not a mission man. I'm a preaching man. I'm a I'm a teacher of courses which nobody in the seminary would teach. So I'm, but I'm not a mission man. But I'm trying to sound like a mission man uh, in this text. I've done a lot of study. And my heart went to the book of Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 15, when Paul had his missionary journey. As I think of that, I read across this information that there, the top, that there are top, top 10 most populous countries in the world. The number one is China. The second is India. Third is United States, Indonesia, Brazil, Pakistan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Russia, and Japan. And that's in millions. And so if you say 1,355 millions, instead of saying million, uh, billion, just say millions. But it tells us how, how, how densely the world is populated today. A number one is China. Uh, they, they have become so big that they, have, that they were able to even get our Scarborough Island. I think we need to witness more to them so that they will turn the island. Is there anybody from China here? Please pardon me. I was told that the total population, that the total people groups is about 16,761, and the enriched people groups are a group of people that is less than 2% evangelical Christians are the following. Total on its people groups, about 7,050. Total population of UPGs, 2.88 billion people. And total percentage of world UPGs make up to about 42.1% of the world population. The enriched people groups alone would tell us that we have a lot to reach because they compose a total of 42.1% of the world's population. And we are told that the rich people group or groups of people that is greater than 2% evangelical Christian or majority Christian population is this. There are about 6,857 groups, 3 billion in population, and total percentage of world and in rich population makes up to 40.1% of the world population. I mean, marami pa sila. I thought it's still Davao. So it tells us that we, has, we still have so many to reach. And uh, in fact, most of the enriched people groups are located geographically in what mission scholars call the 1040 window from west of Africa across Asia between 10 degrees latitude and north of the equator to 14 degrees north. That's quote unquote. And this is how it is the 1040 window. And uh, Makita Mujan, Ang Morocco, Lahat Lahat Jan, and China. This is considered to be the most, uh, this is where the most of the enriched people groups are. Uh, and this is the 10 degrees and 40 degrees north of the equator, covering North Africa and the Middle East and Asia. And if you went farther, it says that the total UPGs in 1040 window is 5,874 enriched people groups, totaling to about 2.75 billion people. 60% of the enriched people groups live in countries close to missionaries from North America. Hindi makapasok doon ang ating mga missionaries galing sa America. Ang mga ASEAN lang ang makapasok doon. 147 of the enriched people groups are not in the 1040 window and this total to about 82,406,000 individuals. Still a lot. Not yet billion, but still a lot. And then we're told that if the church is to embark on missions, I propose that three things are necessary. So if you read through the text, you will see some principles that we can learn from Paul 
during his missionary journey. And I thought this can be a good text for the church to look into if, we want, if they want to strategize for missions. In fact, I'd like to say that if, you, if the church wants to go on mission, this is the first thing that I would like to consider is this. It necessitates extensive preparation. Ating basahan yung ating text. It says, He came to Derby and then to Lydia, Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, and Paul wanted to, to take him along the journey. So he circumcised Timothy. Sakit yun. Because of the Jews who lived in that area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, I think uh, this implies to us that in a very real sense, if we want to really go on missions, just like Paul and his company, they did some preparations. And in this case, we can see some preparations. One, I think, one, I think, is what, the, what, is what I call cultural preparations. It is obvious from the text that Paul had to address church matters and issues with missiological implications before he embarked on missions. In this case, the issue and the matter that has to be addressed with missiological implication is something that refers to the circumcision of Timothy. For cultural reason, he had to circumcise Timothy for the, for the sake of the target population. And in verse 3, the target population is the Jews who lived in that area. Simplistically, Timothy was, ahead, was, was, was asked to sacrifice literally for missions. And I thought that was a real sacrifice. Imagine, when I was about 17 to 21 years old, don't pass a circumcised. Masakit yun! But Paul had to address the situation because anything that will hinder the church or Paul's mission endeavor, pinaprevent niyo yun. He addressed it ahead and I thought it was a real sacrifice. But, they had to do that. Of course, we don't need to belabor the meaning of circumcision. We all know that. Uh, except to mention that Paul was clear in Galatians that it does not have any salvific and sanctifying effect. If you want to know what the word salvific is, ask Dr. Sauri. He was the one who taught me that. Hindi makasay ang circumcision, so to speak. Hindi rin, mag- hindi, rin, hindi rin pwedeng sabihin mong naging mas, mas holy ka if you are circumcised. But Paul, Paul's reason was very clear. Because of the Jews who lived in that area, he circumcised, he, 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 he asked Timothy to go through the process. See, it was something he did for the sake of reaching the Jews. Now, uh, what do you think are we to address culturally if we want to be successful in our mission endeavors? Here are some thoughts coming from the Affinity Gospel Churches in, in Partnership magazine that I took. It says, in order for a church to increasingly build up and cultivate world Christians to engage in cult- cross-cultural mission, the following principles should increasingly characterize our life together. He says, number one, cross-cultural mission and understanding of God's missionary heart must be embedded within the life and character of the church and should be expressed in many different aspects of church life, including our corporate worship. Number two says we should be a people who are informed concerned and involved at home and abroad about social issues of poverty and injustice and who demonstrate 
the heart and compassion of God through prayer, giving, action, and speaking out. It's important that our churches are to be informed, made concerned, and asked to be involved about missions here and abroad if we want to succeed in our mission endeavors. Number three, the church should increasingly understand God's word and the responsibility it places on us to be world Christians, engage in cross-cultural mission through prayer, giving, sending, and our going, so that we might see more from amongst our meads being sent out to the mission field. Number four, he says, the church must be active in supporting missionaries that we know. Now that we know, and we have now counted the missionaries we have in Asia, I, I ask that we uh, be given a list of them so that we can pray for them uh, and then be able to pray for them and support them. The church must be active in supporting the missionaries that we know through pastoral pro support, prayer, giving, and communications. Number five, the prayer life of the church should be characterized by a concern for cross-cultural mission. Hindi lang yung Lord bless me, bless us, bless me, bless us. Let's upgrade our prayer and talk about praying for missions. Talk about prayer for our missionaries and for their target population if we want to succeed in missions and if we want to involve our church. The next he says, the church should seek ways of, a, of undertaking cross-cultural mission locally. Dapat pala kita tayo mismo, mga pastors and mga leaders, must lead our churches to seek ways of understanding cross-cultural mission locally. The church should provide prayer and financial support to those considering going on short-term mission trips or is detailed and in church, church short-term mission policy, for example, if you have one. And so, these are some, some ideas. And in fact, lastly, the church should remember the, and uphold the persecuted church around the world through practical support and prayer. And the church should strive to include people from other cultures into the life of the church, learning from them and appreciating their gifts so that we might better reflect the you know, better understanding of the universal church. And I thought, you know, if, if we want to really prepare, I think the suggestions of this magazine is worthwhile, something that are tenable. But there are a lot more that we can talk about that, but I think we, don't only, we, we, we would only not talk about cultural preparation. We, will also talk, we, we, may, we need also to talk about ethical preparations. Ethically, the church leaders in Jerusalem had to address their value system. In Acts chapter 15, 20, 19, 21 says, And so my judgment after the debate on whether you can eat blood or not, not eat blood or can eat uh, food, uh, meat that's been offered to idols or not, you know, they, they made, they come to a decision and said, And so my judgment is that we should not insist that the Gentiles who turn to God must obey our Jewish laws except that we should write to them to refrain from eating meat sacrificed to idols, from all fornications, and also from eating unbled meat of strangled animals. And you can read that in an the and it becomes clearer. But clearly, the fruitfulness of the church in missions, globally and locally, and Dr. Cassino says one word, locally. The effectiveness and the fruitfulness of a church and missions, globally, says, can be affected by her testimony. Paul knew that by the unity of the church, their effectiveness will be enhanced and promoted, and by the disunity and sexual immorality, the church's effectiveness can be diminished and demoted. And so in deep pudding, pumunta ng mission, maglance into a mission endeavor, without first settling the missiological, cultural, and probably the ethical issues of the church, as per suggested by our text. And Paul did that. Paul had to address these concerns before he went to missions. So, should it be beneficial for our churches to address the same or similar issues before we embark on missions? I think it's very important. 
address our cultural concerns, address our ethical concerns. But then, there are also some things I think that we can address. One, another thing is our financial preparation. The aspect of financial preparation for missions is a given. It is of paramount importance that a church financially prepares. Surprisingly, however, let us note that the countless churches and missionaries have proven, and our church, our missionaries have proven, that God's provisions are not always dependent on a prepared budget before going on missions. Many would testify, and I like this text. If I read that, it says, When we sat down, I mean Paul and his company, and began to speak to the women who had gathered there, one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer of purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. When he and his, the members of his household were baptized, she invited us to her home. Luke wrote, If you consider me a believer in the Lord, he said, she said, Come and stay at my house. Now here is what I, what, here is what I see in this. Too often, we are told by testimonies and by indirect senses of the scriptures, too often his provisions is given along the way. As we go, God provides. When they were going to look for a place of prayer, God sent them to a woman named Lydia. And Lydia was not an ordinary person. She was a very rich business person. She was a, a, she was, her business was selling purple cloth, you know. And I was told that the purple cloth is a very expensive cloth because it will take 12,000 onion shells, uh, 12,000 shells before you are able to produce a cloth with purple color. And it's a very good business. And when they were about to approach a place of prayer, God sent them to Lydia and their Lydia took care of them. Now, <clears throat> the principle that I see here is this. Since the Lord provides what we need as we go, no churches is too poor to embark on missions. See, we cannot say, no, well, wala pa kaming pera. We can't do it. Wala pa kaming budget. We can do it. But no, in this case, while Paul and his company were going to Philippi, God sent them to Lydia. And uh, it is not clearly, it is explicitly stated in the text, but I think it is a logical speculation. Have you, have you been to a situation when you were, when you were led to, to preach in a church or in a camp, for example, or in a missions conference, for example, and then after, after preaching, you're, uh, when, because, they have, because people have become, uh, you have become a blessing to these people, you will be, somebody will shake hands with you and put an envelope in your hand. Uh, you can say, yeah, you, I wonder why you became so silent. Is it true or not? After preaching, after, after, after becoming a blessing to a group of people, rarely would you go without an envelope in your hand. And I thought, would that happen to Paul? And I thought, so. See, he stayed in, a, in the house of a very rich person, and I don't think that Lydia made them leave without an envelope in their hand. In fact, he even made a place to stay. But, of, but uh, it is good to know that as a church embarks on missions, God can send us to Lydia, a dealer of purple cloth, who might also say, come and stay at my house. And so, it is a paramount importance, of course, that we prepare financially if we embark on missions. But I thought that in this angle, we are told that as they went along, as they go along on the journey, God provided what they need. They provided a person who might have been used by God to supply their need. See, God was and is our God who provides for missions. 
So the church, no church can say, wala kaming budget. No. You can even go, just trust in the Lord for provisions. Of course, other preparations. Our, our OSB have an care program. And if you want to, talk about, uh, to know some more about that, uh, our one sending body can talk to you about missionary care. And there's a lot of preparations to do. And Pastor Jamie talked about that kanina in our uh, orientation time. But second, I think, going on missions <clears throat> necessitates absolute compliance with God's instruction. Now read with me. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Messiah, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. And then, so they passed by Messiah and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man Macedon of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel there. Now here is, uh, let, let, let me tell you, uh, show you how Paul obeyed inst God's instruction more, very, very specifically. Let's read again. It says, Paul and his, com his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia. Kita niya dyan? Phrygia and Galatia having kept, been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching to the word of God in the province of Asia when they came to the border of Messiah they tried to enter Bithynia but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to so they passed by Messiah and went down to Troas during the night Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, Luke said, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. See how, how, how intricate was uh, Paul's way of following this, the leading of the, of the Spirit. And in fact, if we read some more, it goes, it goes more than that. From Troas, we put, out, we put out the sea and sailed straight to Samothrace. And the next day, to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days on the Sabbath and we went out to the city gate or to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. Now again, <clears throat> again, I wish to say that our preparation will be more pur purposeful and meaningful if we make sure that we are on track with God. We just don't go ahead and launch anything without being sensitive to God's instruction. Here is, here is what Paul says. Paul being, how did, how did Paul obey God? Here we see in verse 6, Paul obeyed God's instruction when he did not pursue his plan to preach in the province of Asia. And then, Paul obeyed God's instruction when he did not pursue his desire to enter Bithynia. And then, Paul obeyed God's instruction when he responded to the call for help from Macedonia. In fact, during that night, he had a vision. A man from Macedonia was calling, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel there. Now, I was, I was, I was with, with a, a group of tourists last April, and I, the Lord provided, uh, provided the chance for us to have a trip there. And our tour guide simply say, would, 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 would say over and over and over again, and he would, he would say, it has been said, he said, that had, that had Paul not complied with the call to Macedonia, all of Europe today could have become Islam. Buti na lang may isang Paul who was so specific, who was so precise in following God's instruction. Had he not listened to that man from Macedonia in his vision, this tour guide says, 
Had Paul did not comply with the call to go to Macedonia, Europe today is now Islam. Should we not comply? In fact, Paul literally troubled from this. The Via Ignatia. That's where he went through when he spoke the God, when he spread the gospel. And he went through this road. And this road is very significant. It was built by the Romans in AD 27. And somehow that highway became the highway of the gospel to Europe. We have a privilege to go there. And uh, here is part of Neapolis. And here is the highway. We walked through this highway where Paul walked many, many, many years ago. Uh, this highway has been so significant. When you, when you touch the stones and the grass there, you can almost feel and sense Paul walking through that highway. And had not Paul gone through that highway and walked on that highway with the gospel in his hand, Europe today would have become Islam. Oh, I meant to show my wife, so forgive me. Third, going on missions necessitates wholehearted devotion to the God of missions. I think that's the third lesson. Read with me. From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight to, for Samothrace. In the next day to Neapolis, from there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and leading city that, uh, of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city, gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. It's very interesting here how God, how Paul obeyed the Lord. See, from, from all these places, he proceeded to Samothrace, and from Samothrace to Neapolis, and from Neapolis to Philippi, there he met Lydia. When we sat down, he said, he began to speak to the women who had gathered there. Back at women. Well, we're told that in, during that time, in this, in this place, we're called Philippi, there was not yet a synagogue. Because it will take seven men so that you can establish or construct a synagogue. So if there's no, not enough men, at least then, you couldn't have a synagogue. And so there he has no choice. He had to talk with women, <laughs> with the PWMU, a very powerful people. And you can tell that they have a kingdom of their own. If we just can enter into that kingdom, uh, the federation will be blessed. Why would only OSB go under the federation. How about the PMW? Can we borrow your kingdom? Of course, if uh, Ati Presi will not say yes, it won't happen. <laughs> Oppo. Yeah. So he talked to the women. And one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Theatira, who was a worshiper of God, and the Lord opened her heart. It's very interesting. The word open her heart means cut through her heart. You see, we can only open the Bible, but only God can open the heart. And so here, Paul was so faithful in, in, in the spread of the word of God. In fact, they were so serious because they had to find a place of prayer. And when they met Lydia, God cut through the heart of Lydia. As I've said, we can, open, we can only open the scriptures, but it is God who opens the heart. Lydia was the product of it. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home, and if she said, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us there. Now here's the devotion. How devoted should we, should we be? And I think here, devotion can be seen in this way. It is a devotion that was shown by their ever-burning desire to pray. 
As they were traveling, their heart was all, the heart of Paul and his companions were always looking for a place to, to pray. And when they, when they were looking for a place to pray, they, were still, they, were, they have not yet prayed, God sent them legion. You see, missions is a spiritual battle. One cannot take it for granted. If one does not pray, that person loses the battle. It is like, you see, the church is birthed and wired by God to be in, on the offensive. God designed the church to move forward and no gates of hell can stop it. But until we are covered by prayer, we might, we could not succeed. So that devotion of ours, if we talk about missions, should be shown in our ever-burning desire to pray. Third, second, second, it is a devotion that was proven by God's provision for the needs. See, the battle is not done in the battlefield. The battle is done in the unbended, bended knees. Paul said that. But Luke said that, recorded that. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. And one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. And God, God led them to a person who I, don't, I did not doubt, whom I don't doubt have provided their needs. Threat has been detected. Oftentimes, uh, our faith may dwindle, but God's direction is always there. If we are so intense in our prayer, God's provision just comes. Sometimes He leads us to a person. That person can be led for, can be, can be led by God to provide our needs. And this was happened to Paul. But again, of course, <clears throat> of course, third. There was a provision for a place to stay. Second, a provision for finances. Again, I have said a while ago, this is not explicitly stated in the text but we, uh, that we have just read, but looks like this is a logical speculation. I haven't been in a place, in a preaching situation, in a ministry position, that when you have become a blessing to somebody, God will not allow that person to bless you also. But we also see another devotion. A devotion that was proven by harvest of conversions. In 15, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us and there she was baptized. This is a marker near the river built by the Orthodox Church. And in that, in one of the stairs, you see this. The Christogram. The sacred uh, signs saying Christians meet, met here or meet here. They were under persecution, but you will find that in many, many archaeological sites that there were Christians there. And you will see that because of that sign, Christogram. And in front of the church, there is a river. That stone could have been the stone that Paul walked. It's actually a bridge, part of the bridge, where everyone traveling through via Ignatia would pass through and Paul could have stepped on that stone and when I standing on that stone I can imagine the voice of Paul come on Lydia and I'm so blessed when I when when the Lord grant you see I was asked to do a study on this last January and I said Lord would you give me an illustration? And in April, somebody offered me, said, we'll go to Greece. I don't have money. I'll pay for you. And so we went there. And the Lord answered my prayers. And 
we were able to walk where Paul walked. And I, everything that I read in Acts 15 and 16 just came to mind. I said, this is where we go. This is where Paul walked. And this is how Paul reacted to Lydia. And so, you want to go on missions? Remember, it needs extensive preparation. Cultural, ethical, financial preparation. Second, it necessitates absolute compliance with God's instruction. And it takes a man who is soaked in the presence of God to be able to decipher that instruction. Third, going on missions necessitates wholehearted devotion to the God of missions. And so in fact, no church can say we are too poor to start on missions. No, you can if your heart is there, God will take care of the rest. We can, the church can strategize for missions. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for what you have said, what you have shared. And thank you, Lord, that you have given us this experience tonight. An experience of teaching, encouraging, and proving to us, Lord, that Churches, poor and rich churches, can decide to embark on missions because of the lessons we have just heard tonight. I pray that you will bless our hearts and make us receptive to your call and leading tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.